Hi guys. So today we are reading through Mark chapter three. Um, and I just love getting to do this with you guys. So we're going to start, I'm going to read through and then answer the questions from chat GPT. But I also read through before I came on because, well, it's a story. So I'll just tell you guys the story. Basically last night I had already done the Bible studies on life from Mark one and two. And I don't know, I was going to pray last night before I fell asleep. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was prompting me to read through again, but like for him to just minister to me. So it wasn't just coming on and like reading with you guys, but he also wanted to speak to me individually. And so I don't know. I just decided to read through again from Mark 1. And then I read Mark 3 by myself before coming on right now. And there's some other things that I want to talk through as well that weren't in the questions. But we'll just read through together starting in Mark 3 verse 1. Another time Jesus went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard about all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Edomia, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him, to keep the people from crowding him, for he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the impure spirit saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the names Bonagar. Oh my gosh, I've never, Bonar, Bonargus. Guys, have you ever heard that? Like, I've never heard that preach before that his name was changed from John. Anyway, which means sons of thunder. Whoa, that's so cool. Cause I just read that. Like I did read this before, but like, just kind of like, you know, breeze through. But now as I'm like reading slowly and talking to you guys, I'm like, that's so interesting. Anyways, sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Then Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said he is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebul. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, People can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. And so I wanted to talk through 
the reflection questions that again were given through chat gpt so we'll just discuss this together and the first one says why does jesus challenge the pharisees by healing on the sabbath um and what does this teach us about balancing roles and compassion in our faith so i looked up a commentary because and i still want to look more into it my aunt and uncle like my cousins they're orthodox jewish so they keep kosher they have separate uh, meat and dairy separate fridges for that they don't do their dishes together because meat and dairy can't mix so they do that they walk to synagogue on friday night and saturday so they are orthodox religious but my uncle's a doctor and i believe i'm honestly going to reach out to them after this but i believe that they can heal on the sabbath like if he gets a call for work and has to go in even though he's a doctor he can go in because he's saving a life. So I'm not really sure where the change came in. And so I'm going to look into that on my own after. But when I when I was a newbie Christian, a lying spirit came and told me I blessed from the Holy Spirit. It freaked me out for a while. Demons never play fair. They lie. That's so true. Demons do lie. You did not blaspheme the Holy Spirit. So we're going to talk about that because that's also one of the questions that I wanted to talk about. But no, you didn't. You're good. Well, I'm not God, but we'll talk about it. Um. So real quick, though, for Sabbath traditions, basically in Judaism, there were these like Pharisees who were just kind of very reputable um, rabbis. And even till current, there was just very notable rabbis. And basically they went through what's considered work and what's considered rest. And so, for example, let's say years ago, years ago, you were going to start a fire. You had to go out into the wilderness, collect branches, start like, what, what's that thing? Like when you like do the thing and you get the fire going. Yeah. You had to do that and do like all this work. You're going out. It's labor. It was intense labor and you're starting a fire and then you're catching your food and then you're cooking the food over the fire. Like you get the point. And so the rabbis, which I can understand, but it's an interesting way that they came about it. And this is the challenge, you know, that Jesus addresses, but that was considered work. And so the rabbis were like, you're not to do that on the Sabbath. Basically, you ought to like make more food and start the fire and everything that you need for that next day for Friday to Saturday so that you don't have to labor and you don't have to work. So now modern day, we have, you can't light a fire. So we can't drive. Like my Orthodox cousins don't drive on the Sabbath. And a lot of Orthodox Jews don't drive because of that principle, like don't start a fire. And so like the gas, like in the car, there's like a spark that starts. And so my understanding that I've talked with rabbis about and researched into, and I'd encourage you to research as well, but is that that was considered work. And so they'd like be like, oh, you can't drive, even though driving isn't really work. However, it's lighting, lighting a fire. And so all that to say, there were a lot of Sabbath traditions that were basically embodying work. And that's what the rabbis came up with. So for example, if you cut your finger, and this was in a Bible commentary I read that I'll link um, in the caption because it's really helped my faith a lot too, but it's called Enduring Word Bible Commentary. I think goes verse by verse and breaks it down. And so one thing that they address is if you were to cut your finger and it was and um it was bleeding, you could like stop yourself from bleeding if whether that's you know putting salt on it or just like holding it or getting a napkin, like you could stop the bleeding, but you weren't allowed to use ointment or use anything to heal it because you couldn't heal on the Sabbath. It was unlawful. And so when Jesus healed on the Sabbath, it was just interesting to me when I was reading it. Jesus could have healed any day he wanted to. Like, I I honestly think he was doing it to prove a point. Like, if your ox were to fall into a ditch at the time, if your ox fell into a ditch, you could get out the ox. Like, you would go and save it. So how much more is a human life worth saving that it's, like, interesting that the people were like, oh, you can't heal on the Sabbath. So Jesus, I believe, to prove a point, was like, This is life, like what, which is lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill. Like the Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. Like it is a day of rest for us, for our good. And so he's saying that 
like what is good to do, obviously to save someone's life or heal. And so that's what happened there. And I think that was what Jesus was kind of addressing. What was just man-made rules that we follow in tradition and society versus what is God's law and what is at the heart of the law? Because the law is all meant to point us to God and to God's heart. And so that was what he was going like going to address. Second question. What can we learn from the enthusiasm of the crowds following Jesus and how should their desperation for healing influence our approach to sharing the gospel today? I find it to be really fascinating how Jesus went around healing and people even believe that. Like when I was reading that, it says that the people watched him closely to see what he was going to do. Um, in verse two, Mark three, verse two. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. And so, I don't know, maybe that's just me like really reading and like looking into, you know, the Bible, but it's like to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Like, I think that they believed that he could. Like, Jesus was going around doing amazing miracles and setting so many people free. There was all this traction picking up about him. He was getting all of these crowds following Jesus, like pushing their way through to get to Jesus. That I believe that people like saw Jesus doing amazing things and believed he could heal. And I think that's ought to challenge us today as believers. When is the last time that you went and prayed for somebody to be healed? If you were in a grocery store, if you were out walking around, when's the last time that you went and you saw somebody maybe with a cast on or limping or something that you just said, look, I'm a follower of Jesus and I believe he was healing in the Bible and he's healing again today. Can I pray for you? And I don't know that God will, but I know that he can. And I would love to pray for you and be a part of what God could possibly do with a miracle right now in your life. Like when's the last time you've done that? That's just something I wanted to encourage you to challenge you with. And it speaks to me too. I was, after this, I'm going to get to the gym and I was praying God, so I'll keep you posted. Maybe in Mark 4 tomorrow if I get on, which I'm praying I do. But when I get on, I'll give you guys an update if there's something that happens and now it keeps me accountable too. But that I was praying God would bring me somebody or show me someone that I could pray for. Maybe it's for a healing because I don't want to just read the Bible and hear it, but not do what it says. And that's what I think it talks about that in James. Don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word of God. So it's Like I'm reading this right now. I'm doing a Bible study. I'm encouraging you guys in this. I want to be someone who's also doing the same thing. I want to be somebody who's living out what the Bible says and walking in the miracles of God, praying for people in life today and not just leaving the word of God as like a book from back then that, oh, if God wants to, he could use somebody else. No, God, like if you, if you're willing and if you want, like, please Lord, use me, I'm willing. And I'm, I want to be used by you, Jesus. So that's something that I think it speaks to healing that it should influence our approach to sharing the gospel today and healing people from their sin by preaching the gospel to them. I just love this so much. And I want to talk about that to you guys too. In verse 14, it says he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. So Jesus was sending them out to preach. And this is something that really does like, ah, like it just frustrates me when I think about it, but then I use it for good. And I don't let, you know, sit there in anger about it. And I use that to fuel ministry in my life. But something I'm so passionate about is that No one ever came up to me in a grocery store, out in public, in a public scene outside of the church and preached the gospel to me or prayed for me, asked if there was anything they could pray for, if I had something that like needed to be healed or whatever. Like nobody ever came up to me in public and prayed for me or told me about Jesus. And that breaks my heart because now I still live like where I've grown up my whole life. And it's like, these people in these churches, like there's so many people who profess to be Christians, who wear their necklace, who go to church on Sunday. And I understand inviting you to church and saying, you know, come to church with me and whatever. But I don't think that's how it was intended to be. I believe that we were meant to be the church and to bring people the hope of God to them, to then bring them into the body of Christ. And they'll want to come to the church. And so you know, church as in the building. And that just really 
breaks my heart, honestly, and fuels, like I said, my ministry to go out and pray for people because nobody had ever done that for me. And I'm 22 years old, like 22 years, even still, now that I am a Christian, no one's come up to me and asked to tell me about Jesus. And man, we have the hope that these people need. We have hope in our heart for eternity, for heaven one day, and to have a relationship with God here on earth. I just, we ought to be telling people about Jesus. I heard an atheist. Now I'm on a soapbox. This We can just end this year, honestly. But I heard an atheist in an interview say, and it was so good. It challenged me so much. He said, I'm not a, I'm not a Christian. I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God at all. But if you're somebody who says you're a Christian, then you should be telling me about the gospel. You should be telling me about Jesus and coming up to me. And telling me, because if you don't, you must hate me because you don't love me enough to tell me the truth that you believe in, that I'm going to hell for not being in a relationship with Jesus. And I just thought he's right. Like, that's so true that if we're not willing to go and tell people about the hope that we have about Jesus and our relationship with him, that we believe that we're sinful from birth, from the time that we're born, we are sinful and in need of a savior. And God sent his son, Jesus to die on a cross for us. And that we could have a relationship with God, the father through, through accepting that Jesus died and paid such a high price for us that he wants to be in a relationship with us. Like we ought to repent of our sins and, you know, ask God for his forgiveness, turn from our wicked ways and turn to live for God. And we have that promise of heaven. Like we, that's the message that we have that we know and we have a true relationship with God. And I just thought that the person who was the atheist that said that in an interview was so right. And that should encourage us to share our faith even more. I'm going to read the comments really quick. Chris is saying, I've seen Jesus do some amazing healings on my workplaces. Wait, can you tell me about them? If you want to just write them in the comments. I wonder if there, wait, there was a way, which I don't even know if this would be like a good idea, but I don't know, whatever. But to like split screen share and like have people come on. That would be so cool. Maybe there is. Let me know. That'd be kind of fun. Um, But yeah, if you want to just write in the comments some of those stories, that'd be really cool because I post these as videos afterwards. So people could then like read them and see them and like comment back to you, you know? And then you said, most people in the church don't pray for anyone outside of the four walls. That's what I'm saying. That is exactly what I'm saying. That we invite people to come to church, the building, like, oh, come to church with me. And then we expect the pastor to save people. And like all this pressure is on him to do everything. But that was never the design of the church. We are the church, not the building. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. And I think that's exactly true. Jesus said it best as he always does that really the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And I just hope that this encourage you guys to be people that go out into the world and be the light and share the hope of Jesus with you guys. Um, there was a broken arm paralyzed in a motel room next to the restaurant. I wait, broken arm paralyzed in a motel room next to the restaurant I worked at and a sick baby he he healed overnight and a hurt shoulder too many lists Jesus does um guys like there's one literally commenting right now with like healing stories I'll tell you one so I was at my grandpa's um funeral this was a few years back and there was this woman and she had an eye patch on her eye and so we were it was after the funeral we all went to like basically where his favorite bar was that he would go and hang out at all the time. And he, uh, um, so yeah, everyone from the funeral, whoever could go went to this bar, this woman there had an eye patch on her eye. And so I'm looking at her and it's funny, I'm going to find a way. I don't know how to do it, but maybe I could just put a screenshot of it in the captions, but she posted it on her Facebook. I'll get there. I'm spoiling it. But basically she had an eye patch on. And I'm looking at her and I was like feeling so drawn to like pray for her. And I don't know. I believe God can heal. I've seen him heal. We're reading these stories right now that Chris is writing in the comments that Jesus does amazing miracles and heals people. So I believe God can heal, but I also believe that he doesn't always. And when he doesn't, it's because he's using it for a testimony or for our good or for his glory in some other way. And I just trust he's good even when the outcome isn't what we're wanting. Well, in this particular instance, 
she was getting ready to leave. And I just was like, ah, I don't want to miss the opportunity. And I kept feeling the Holy Spirit nudge me to go and pray for her, for her eye. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, okay. So my brother, not the time my brother wasn't a believer. He is now. We'll have to get his testimony on. But at the time he wasn't a believer and my mom was a believer, I think, I think. Yeah. Anyways, so I get up out. I was like, guys, like I have to get out of the booth. And they were like, my mom knew. She's like, are you going to go pray for her? And I was like, yes, I have to. I have to. And so my brother's like, okay. So I like get out from the booth and she's getting ready to walk out. And so I just tapped her and I didn't know who she was. But I said that I was like, I don't know if you believe in Jesus or have a relationship with him. And she was like, yeah, like I, I do. I, I know who Jesus is. So it was kind of like, yes, she knows who Jesus is, like how I know Justin Bieber, but like, I don't really know Justin Bieber as like a friend or someone really close in my life. I just know about him. So that was probably what I was getting from her relationship with God. And so she got, she said like, yeah, like I know Jesus. And I was like, well, I believe that he's still healing to this day. Can I pray for you to be healed? And I don't know that he will, but I know that he can. And I would just love to pray with you. What happened um, if you don't mind me asking, like what happened? And she said she had a blood hemorrhage in her eye. And um, she, uh, I don't remember, it was a few years back, like I had said, but I don't remember how it happened or what, but basically she was partially blind in that eye. Or no, I'm sorry. She was fully blind in that eye, um, which is why she was wearing an eye patch on. So I was like, okay, well, let's pray. And so I laid hands on her and prayed for her. And then she was just like really moved by it, but said, thank you. And like, that was it. And she walked out and left Well, I go and I sit back in the booth with my family. And my brother was like, well, like kind of this, like, did anything happen? Like at the name of Jesus, you just prayed for her. Did anything happen? And I was like, uh, like, I don't know. I didn't, nothing happened. I didn't ask her. I just prayed for her. And he was like, well, did you get her number or anything to be able to like, follow up like maybe when she goes to the doctor she would have an answer for you and I was like honestly it's not really about me it's between her and Jesus so I I didn't think about it like I wasn't thinking in the moment about me I just was going by faith that God if you want to you will and so I didn't get her number or anything to like contact her I didn't like know her personally so that was kind of it so she goes to leave and it was just kind of like okay well nothing happened I guess who knows and then the next day, guys, this was crazy because I didn't even know, but my mom knew her on Facebook and I guess, or like found her on Facebook or they friended each other. Well, she posted the whole story on her Facebook. I have to find it to show you guys or put in the comments, but she posted it on Facebook basically that she was wearing her eye patch and she had this blood hemorrhage. The doctor said it wouldn't be healed. I prayed for her. And she went to the doctor and the blood hemorrhage was gone. Her eye was nearly healed. It wasn't fully able to see, but she could see. Like it wasn't 20-20 vision, but she was able to see out of her eye. And she posted the whole story on her Facebook. And then my mom sent it to me in a text. I was like, oh my gosh, she posted this whole story on her Facebook. And now her and I are friends on Facebook. And I should probably follow up about how her eye is doing. I'm actually going to reach out to her after this as well. So, so cool, God. So cool. I just want to encourage you guys to pray for people. Like the worst that happens is they're in the same position that they were already in, which is not healed. But the best that happens is that they're healed. There's a miracle done. And God uses you to get to be a part of that. So go God. That's all. Okay. Next question. Three. Jesus chose 12 ordinary men to be his, his apostles. How does their selection encourage us about our own potential for being used by God? That's just it. Jesus chose 12 ordinary people, like so random. Just And then even when he called, I think it was like before, yeah, in Mark 1, when it says Jesus calls his first disciples, it's like Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw Simon and his brother, Andrew, casting a net into the lake, and they were fishermen. And then eventually he says, I'll send you out to fish for people. And like, they were just living their everyday ordinary lives. They were ordinary people, but yet God used them to accomplish and do amazing, extraordinary things. And that's so encouraging to me and hopefully to you too, that you don't need to be anybody special. Moses, Abraham, Isaac, like 
Esther in the Bible. There's just so many of these people that were ordinary people, but God used them to do extraordinary things. And I think that often God isn't looking for people who are perfect. He isn't looking for people of stature or of fame or someone who's just loved by everybody. God is looking for the person who's willing to say yes to him, who's willing to, when the whole crowd is doing something, they're willing to go against the grain and they're, you know, everyone else is doing this one thing or going out and living for the world, but you're willing to say, God, I want to live for you. I want to be right with you, God. And you're choosing to pray. You're choosing to seek him. You're choosing to put God first in your life and not follow the patterns of the world. That's what Jesus is looking for. He's looking for your heart. He's well, wait, welcome to meeting each other. I don't know. Um, it like looks different. That's what I'm just saying, but I don't know how to, what to do with that. But anyways, um, so yeah, it's just, God is looking for people who are ordinary people that just want to, you know, live a life surrendered to God's will and you join membership. That means so much. Thank you. And so I just, we'll talk about that after. Oh, that's so fun. Okay, guys, YouTube Live is so cool. And you're able to build actual community through it. So I'm really loving this. Anyway, yeah, so Jesus chose 12 ordinary men to be his apostles. And I hope that that encourages you as well, that you don't need to be somebody who you think is like, oh, well, I'm not Moses. I'm not Abraham. I'm not a prophet. It's not about all of those things. It's about really seeking God and wanting to do his will for your life and turn from the empty, fleeting things of this world. Um, so next question, how do Jesus's responses? Okay, so actually scratch that. This was the question from ChatGPT, but I wanted to narrow it in. And I put it in the comments what the cap, what the questions were going to be. So I changed it. And so the fourth question I want to answer is, what does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? What is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Um, it says, oh, please keep me in your prayers. I've been dealing with a lot of intrusive thoughts. Um, I'm so sorry to hear that. And I just want to pause that question really quick. We'll come back to it. But I would love to pray with you. So if you're watching this and you would love to partner in prayer with me, I think that's a really important thing that I'd rather just stop doing this to address that at the moment. So Heavenly Father, God, I just lift up these intrusive thoughts that are going on right now in this person's mind. And I pray for peace. I thank you, God, that you're the Prince of Peace, that you're a wonderful counselor. And I ask, Lord, that you would just bring this person's mind to be stilled and bring clarity that anything that the devil is whispering would cease right now in the name of Jesus and that she would know or he would know how loved they are by you, God, and that you're in control and that lies from the enemy must flee right now in the name of Jesus. The devil has no authority and must go right now. We, we declare peace. We pray for a still mind. And I just thank you, God, for this person. Would you be with them? And would you be their comfort? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, okay, so back to the question, what is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? I believe, and so I researched into this as well. Basically, and it was from, um, amen, God bless you. God bless you too. It was from this uh website that I really love that I'll also like blow all these things. I'm, I want it to be very like rooted in research and not just like, well, what I think is, um, so it's called gotquestions.org and they have a really good article on this. So again, I'll link that below, but, um, basically it was saying that blasphemy of the Holy spirit. I'll just read this little section. Cause I screenshotted it to be able to read for you guys. And it says, Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit has to do with accusing Jesus Christ of being demon possessed instead of spirit filled. This particular type of blasphemy cannot be duplicated today. The Pharisees were in a unique moment in history. They had the law and the prophets. They had the Holy Spirit stirring their hearts. They had the Son of God himself standing right in front of them. And they saw with their own eyes the miracles he did. Never before in the history of the world and never since had so much divine light been granted to men 
if anyone should have recognized Jesus for who he was, it was the Pharisees. Yet they chose defiance. They purposely attributed the work of the spirit to the devil, even though they knew the truth and had the proof. Jesus declared their willful blindness to be unpardonable. Their blasphemy against the Holy Spirit was their final rejection of God's grace. They'd set their course and God was going to let them sail into perdition unhindered. Okay, so basically it's saying that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit isn't like the same today as it was like at that moment in time, because we don't physically have Jesus walking on earth with us right now. We have the Holy Spirit that guides us and speaks to us. Jesus is at the right hand of the father currently in heaven and God is still on the throne. However, we don't have the same relationship, obviously, because he's not walking here on earth right now as they did then. However, it then goes on to say the unpardonable sin. So basically like the unforgivable sin that's equivalent to blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is just that blasphemy of the the spirit of God, not just Jesus. Because in this case, it was saying he said this because in verse 29, 29 and 30, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They're guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he, Jesus, Jesus has an impure spirit. We're not saying that right now because we're not seeing Jesus in the flesh, but I think that we're able to blaspheme the Holy Spirit when we're walking in continued unbelief. So in John 16, 8, it says, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And so basically like the Holy Spirit is still working on the world's hearts. Like there is still feelings of like, right and wrong. And the Holy Spirit draws people in to a relationship with God. And so if you're just constantly choosing to reject the Holy Spirit and eventually like sear your conscience, because I believe that you're able to sear your conscience. You're able to all of a sudden you you feel, maybe you feel really convicted about something. You feel, let's say it's doing drugs. I don't know. I'm just get, throwing an example out there. You feel very convicted about drugs. Um, But you really want to do it. And then eventually the struggle starts to go away. You feel like the Holy Spirit is tugging on your heart to like not be around those friends when they're in the context of doing drugs and they invite you over. And then you want to keep doing drugs and you're in environments to do drugs. The Holy Spirit's like wanting to steer you away from those environments and those situations because we're called to be sober minded. But you just start to suppress that and sear your conscience like, well, it's not that bad. Well, God doesn't really care. Where does it say exactly specifically in the Bible that I shouldn't do this particular drug with my friends in this context in 2024? Like, oh, it doesn't say that. I think it's fine. Like, eventually, I think you're able to, like, brush past what the Holy Spirit is convicting you of to then just not even feel conviction in that thing anymore because you're so far suppressing the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says if you're being disciplined, God like disciplines those who he, who he loves. And so if you're being disciplined, you're told to stay away from doing those things or he's wanting to redirect you from something or a sin that you're doing. It's because he loves you and he always loves you. He loves like all people. I think that the Holy Spirit, though, when you just keep pushing the Holy Spirit away and you are rejecting what you know that the Spirit is leading you to do like over and over and over. I think eventually we just get given over to our sin. We just get given over to the thing we're fighting so much for. But I would say that I believe that though you get given over to that thing that you're just fighting God so much for, eventually God is so good and he's so faithful that he doesn't let you go. And eventually you'll come back, whether you you might just end you know, in a pit, you get in this situation where you're so far from God and you feel so encapsulated by your sin that you just come right back to Jesus in repentance. That's the hope. That's always God's, you know, desire that you would return back to him. And so I think that there could be a point where we just, um, you know, get, get given over to our sin. We just live however we want that God's like, okay, like you want it so bad here. And then when we recognize that actually what we want is God's will for our life, because what he says and what he wants for us is best that we then come to back to our senses ultimately. And we're like, okay, God, I want your will and not my own. And we turn from that in repentance. So I think blasphemy of the Holy spirit though. I think if you've ever wondered, like, 
have I ever committed like the unforgivable sin? Have I blasphemed the Holy Spirit? Like if you're wondering that or concerned about that or afraid of that, I really don't believe that you have. Like I just, if you're in a relationship with Jesus, you love God, you're trying to live for the Lord. I don't think God is this like gotcha God. Like, oh, like you didn't listen to me one time or you messed up or you made a mistake. Okay, damn to hell forever. Like that is not the God that we serve. He's He defines himself as gracious and merciful and slow to anger and quick to forgive when he was, you know, in Mount Sinai coming from the mountain. Like that's the God that we serve. He is not sitting there waiting for you to mess up to then point your finger and send you to hell. Like that's not God. And so I think if you're worried about blaspheming the Holy Spirit or you're like, I don't even know if I did, have I or have I not? I just, I hope this gives you peace and pray about it. Again, don't just take all of what I'm saying, but I'm pretty convinced that if that's something you definitely don't want to be doing, that you didn't. If you love the Lord and you're trying to live for Jesus, I wouldn't worry about that, honestly. Um, just keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Fix your eyes on the Lord and everything else will follow. You know, be in the word of God, be in biblical community, grow in your faith, walk by faith, not by sight. Do the things, you know, you have a relationship with Jesus. I just, I think you're good. I think you're good. I don't know, whatever. Um, but I thought this was an interesting commentary because I had never heard that before. And I think it's definitely something too that theologians and people could go back and forth on or not have a clear understanding on. But I just do believe that um, if it's something you're worried about or something you don't want to be doing, then I just wouldn't worry about it, honestly. Um, recognize the evil th- recognize the evil thoughts are not yours, but the enemy trying to trick you into thinking that they're your thoughts. Amen. Good point, Chris. It's hard to ignore the thoughts though. Oh guys, we, I love this. That was back to when we had prayed for her. Um, and over like their thoughts and their mind. And so Chris, thank you for that. That's so encouraging to build, you know, godly community with one another. So last question says, um, Jesus redefines family as those who do God's will. How does this perspective challenge our priorities and relationships? And how can we live out this principle in our daily interactions? I believe that family is our first ministry, that we can get very wrapped up in like church and and our friends and in Christian events or playing the Christian parts. But I believe, and I think it was actually Mother Teresa that said it best, I believe. Don't quote me on that, but I believe it was Mother Teresa. And she said, if you want to change the world, go back home and love your families. And that is so good. I agree, Mother Teresa, that that's so good. And I think that often, I at least I've seen it and heard it, that when you're so wrapped up in like everything else and everyone else and wanting to change the world and do all these things, often we neglect our family first. And... I think that how we treat our family is the best reflection of our heart and who are who we are in like our character because they see us at all point in times. They see us at our best. They see us at our worst. They see, you know, if, we're, if I'm going up to preach on a Sunday morning, they're able to know my character and my heart to see, am I in the word of God through the week? Am I actually praying? Am I praying for my family? Am I showing up? Am I serving at home? What? what are the fruits of my life before I just go and get up on a stage and pick up a microphone and start speaking? I think that the fruit of our life and our actions should speak louder than anything we ever have to say into a microphone or anything we say publicly ever is the actions and the fruit of our life speaking louder than that. And I think when it comes to our family at home, and this isn't regarding the Bible right now, but I just wanted to make this point that Man, love and serve your families. When's the last time you called your mom? When's the last time you reached out to your dad? Even when you have a severed relationship or you're holding on to unforgiveness or you're holding on to bitterness, make those things right. Mend your families. And it's just, there's no one that has your back more than your family. And I believe that the family relationship is one of the best examples we have of the kingdom of God. Example, God is the father. This is something I heard in a teaching one time. God is the Father, the Holy Spirit, and not to say, not to say this, 
but the Holy Spirit has more like womenly qualities of being like caretaking and guiding and nurturing. So in a sense, if we're thinking about in the family unit, in a sense, the Holy Spirit could be seen like that of like motherly qualities. And Jesus is the son of God, you know, Jesus is a son. And I believe that that's why the enemy attacks the family so much because it's such a clear representation of heaven between a father, a mother and the, ch- and the children. Um, and I think that that's why, and often too, the enemy goes to attack the dad because if he can remove the father from the family, all of a sudden the mom's a single mom. She has to rely on herself. The parents then see God as their father. But if their father left their life, oh, like, I don't want to believe in God as my father. Like the only representation I've had of an earthly dad is, you know, a deadbeat or father who left me or was abusive or angry or hateful. I don't want to follow God as my father if that's what he's like. And so the enemy will often attack the father and the family to try and break apart the family structure. And then we have a bad view of God, the father. But I think that Again, if we want to change the world, go back, love your families, mend things in your families, call your parents, reach out to your siblings, work on those relationships because it's so worth it in the end. And it's, we're called to, we're called to love, we're called to serve everyone and anyone. And that being said, it includes your family. In this context as well, he, Jesus says in verse 34, then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. And the question asked, it said, um, how can we live out this principle in our daily interactions and how does it challenge our priorities and our relationships? And I think that it's really hard to gossip and slander somebody who's, you know, in the body of Christ, even if you don't like them, even if you don't like this person, maybe it's just something so simple as you just don't get along with them. We're just not going to click with everybody. That's just reality. We're not going to be best friends with everybody all the time, but it's really hard to talk bad about people or gossip or tear them down when you're viewing them as a brother or a sister. Like I, we, I say this with my brothers. We talk about this. We've like joked about it in the past, but I love my brothers. I have triplet brothers. They're 25. Um, and, uh, I'll be honest. I love them. I love them so much. And we're really close. If we weren't family, maybe, maybe one of them <laughs> actually, if, you know, in the context we're in class together or whatever, like, I don't know how before, cause he wasn't a Christian, whatever. If we weren't family, we wouldn't be friends for the most part. And I think that's the unique thing about family is they're like built in friends that you have to learn how to get along with one another even when you're so different, like, (laughs) no, literally, like, I love them so much. But I'm like, I just don't see us being friends, like if we weren't related. Um, But again, it causes you to grow so much as a person, because it's like, wow, we are so different. But I'm gonna love you through our differences, not even in spite of them. But because of them, because we're so different, I'm gonna learn how to get along with people and to be gracious or be patient or learn to love. Like, what is it? You know, um, I'd be feeling the same way sometimes. No, I'm just saying it's real, but this is not in the, um, the notes, but I wanted to read it anyways, because I think it's so good. And it's currently my favorite, like passage. Yeah. My favorite passage right now, but it basically is, I think it's Matthew six. I could be wrong though. Let me look. No, Matthew. Let me, I have to find it. I'm sorry, guys. Just give me a second. Um, yes. Okay. Matthew five. It says love for enemies. Not that my family is my enemy. So we're just, we're steering clear for a second. So (laughs) hold on with me. Okay. So verse 43 in Matthew five, 43, it says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? 
And I think that's so good. And that whole Matthew five, here's some homework. Matthew five is so good. And all before that too, where it says like, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn them the other cheek. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, give them your coat. Like what good is it to only love and get along and be kind to the people that are like us that are easy to love? Like that's not the call of the gospel. The call of the gospel is to love others as you love yourself. It's not love those who love you. It's love all people. And I think often Jesus will challenge us to love people who aren't like us, to love people who we would least likely think we'd ever get along with or least likely want to be friends with are the people that we need to love and show kindness towards and care for. Um, And I just think loving your family (laughs) at the end of the day, loving your family at times because love them, but they can be hard to love sometimes. And, um, you know, or you're just together so much all the time that that's such an opportunity to bring heaven to earth, you know, to love them through things that you go through and hardships and have hard conversations. So that's just something. Um, but again, I think that family is the body of Christ. My brothers, my sisters, if you're in a relationship with Jesus, you are my brother and you are my sister. And I just, I think it's, I think I would, you know, emphasize that note that it's really hard to tear people down in the body of Christ and gossip's got to go like enough of that. We're grown, like stop tearing people down. Stop gossiping about them. Like enough of that, especially in the church. It's so divisive and says in, what is it? I think it's in Proverbs. It says like gossip is choice morsels that go down to the inmost parts of our being. And basically in the end, it leads to destruction. So it's like, oh, gossip tastes so good. And it feels so good in the moment. It's so fun. You get the dirt on people. You're like in the conversation. But right after it's over, you feel so unfulfilled and kind of just like, oh, like I, like you knew it was wrong. And even when you're in it, you're like, I should stop doing this. But then you just keep going and you get in this like hole with it. Just stop the gossip. And I think honestly, I'm someone that's just like, I've literally said, and I I think it's so important if it's family that we're talking about, our brothers and sisters in Christ, that especially if it's our brother talking about another brother or, you know, our sister about another sister to be like, listen, this is gossip. Have you gone to the person and told them that? Probably not. I'll tell you, probably not. And so it's like, have you gone to that person and have you talked about this with them or, or even just like, this is gossip. Like, I don't want to be a part of this conversation right now. Um, so I'm just gonna walk away. Like, I think that we need to be quick to shut gossip down. And I understand that it's awkward. It feels uncomfortable, but it's so important. Um, Chris wrote, I have a drug dealer as a neighbor and I've been struggling with loving him, but I know God loves him. He told me that he loves him and I told him God loves him. Well, that's amazing. And Uh, I can understand that it's hard to love people who are hard to love or hard to love people that live differently than we do or see life different than we do in any context. But you being the light to him or just showing up or caring for him or praying for him um, is just something that goes a long way. Or if there's anything he needs, like maybe, you know, sort of, because he might say things of like, you know, whatever, like, oh, I need drugs. No, you don't. Like, that's not what you would want, you'd want to do. But like, maybe whatever, you get what I'm trying to say. Just go love him. Go love him. Ask God, ask God for a strategy. Ask God, like, how can I love this person who I'm struggling to love? And God will speak to you. He'll help you and he'll show you. Um, How do we make good godly friends that I can pray and do life with? Oh, that's such a good question. So my first encouragement would be, okay, I'll just go through some practical things. First encouragement is to pray, really pray and ask God to bring you godly community and godly friendships. Um, Maybe that looks like I have a journal. This is what mine looks like. Um, But I've gone through like quite a few now, but yeah, so I have a journal and I just write and journal all of my prayers, all the things on my mind. And um. This is something I do too, that this could work for anything. So I'll come back to that question. But basically at night, these for the past three days, this is what I've been doing. And I'd love if you guys did it too. And when I come back tomorrow, um, let me know. Let me know how it goes. But I'll set my phone timer 
for 10 minutes. So before I go to bed, I set my phone timer for 10 minutes and I close my eyes and I just basically brain dump all of my prayers to God where I'm just like praying for my family members, my friends. I'm praying for you guys. Um, and I'm going to keep you in my prayers with just, you know, everything that you're battling mentally, because I know that that could be so hard to decipher what's real, what's not, what's from God, what's the enemy, but praying for every, I just pray everything that's on my mind. And I talk to God about everything on my mind. So I basically just brain dump everything. And then when the timer goes off, I then reset the 10 minute timers, but I listen and I just simply sit there now that nothing's in my mind anymore. Cause I got it all out. And I just say like, okay, Holy spirit, like speak to me and I'll praise him. And I just worship him. And I just thank him for being in the room and for speaking to me. And I'll be honest so far, like, it's not like I've heard anything crazy or I've had this like crazy experience yet. Though I have had crazy experiences with God, but nothing's happened yet. But there's been prayers that have been answered that I've prayed the night before the next day of things that God's done. And I just know he hears me. And I want to encourage you to. So for you with praying for godly friendships and people to pray and do life with, pray, really set that 10 minute timer and pray and not to put God in a box, to only give him 10 minutes. But I think it's a great start. I think it's something practical that we could do right now. And as you spend more time with him, you'll want to spend more time and more time and it will grow. And, you know, your friendship with him will grow as well. So be praying for God to send you some godly community. Also, being plugged in church is so huge. Go get involved in your local church um, and join small groups if your church has small groups. Or if not, I think there's other churches around the area that you could also just go and maybe they have a midweek service. I'm not sure, again, you know, how old you are or um, what type of friends. If you're younger, there's youth groups that are often on Wednesday night. Some of them I've known to be on Fridays, but whatever that looks like, you could Google like youth groups around me, um, Christian youth groups around me, or go to other churches, maybe some churches around you that you could visit like sun on different Sundays or different days of the week, if they have Saturday night services and just put yourself in environments around godly community. Um, and so that way you're just in more situations to meet more people. I think have a home church that you're at, but if you're looking for godly community, go put yourself fish where the fish are, you know, like you're not going to find godly community. If you're looking for them only at the bars, not that you're doing that, but just, you know, in general, you're not going to find godly community in places where there aren't going to be more wholesome Christian people for the chances of finding them, which would be a church or a small group or Bible studies. Um, where else? I think I'm trying to think maybe there's no, I don't, I don't know. I'm not really a fan of like apps just personally, but I don't know. Maybe other people are, maybe there's some Christian friends ordeal going on. I don't really know, but that's the biggest thing is definitely church and small groups. Um, but yeah, and here, like, we're friends now. I mean, I know I don't know you personally, but I'd love to connect with you. Um, my Instagram is at tristan.tice, T-R-Y-S-T-E-N dot T-I-C-E. So we could, you know, follow each other, be friends on there. Uh, but hopefully that as this continues to grow, there's godly community that grows here as well. And I believe that social media can be used in such a beautiful way to build genuine connection even though at times it's isolating and it, you know, it does take people away from real life community. I think it can also bring it together. And I just want to be someone who looks more at the positive view of it rather than just hating on it for what it is and just making the most of it. So that's something I'd encourage you with. If anyone else has other suggestions, you could comment that down below and we can help to build each other up to, um, you know, point people towards Jesus. Um, someone wrote, hi, Hey, nice to meet you. I'm Tristan. Thanks for being here. But that's all for today. Those are the questions I walked through. I hope that this was a blessing and an encouragement to you. And I will plan on seeing you guys again tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. I'm wondering, I was talking about this with my brother. Um, I should bring him on. You guys should meet him. But if I should have like a set time that I go on YouTube live, so you can always expect that I'm coming on at that time. Um, amen. Thank you. And God bless you. God bless you too. Not Christian though. LOL. Um, that's okay that you're not Christian. You can be here too. We're happy you're here. 
Um, and maybe it's something you're interested in knowing about or just having some of these conversations about. I actually love that you're not a Christian watching this because I love to like kind of talk about some things. Or if I said something that you were like, oh, I don't agree with that. Or I don't agree with the Bible. Like we can then talk through it. I don't want to be surrounded by people who only think or believe what I think and believe. I like to be challenged in my thoughts and come back to the word of God. So I'm glad you're here. Um, praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. So I'm going to come up with a time possibly, if not just sporadically, whenever I can come on. But my goal has been to be on every single day. So I love you guys so much and I will play to see you tomorrow. Bye.